podcast where we talk to smart people, but not necessarily done by smart people. That is an awesome question. This one goes down probably on one of my top five. Hey, I like nutrition. I like to eat food. This is the coolest thing ever. We're going to do this forever. I wish I paid more attention in that class. You know, I'm going to be honest. I don't understand that. <laughs> As a man, I just, I don't get it. Welcome to Welcome smartpeoplepodcast.com. To smartpeoplepodcast.com. Hey, everyone. Chris with Smart People Podcast here. You are in the right place. I have a question for you. Do you like music? Of course you do. If the answer is no, what is wrong with you? Well, I have a personal stake in this one, but you may be aware that Fiona Apple released her new album, and it was the first album in almost a decade that got a perfect score on Pitchfork. Why am I telling you this? Well, the drummer for that album, Amy Wood, is also the drummer in a band with my brother. Their music has appeared on The CW. It's appeared in Grey's Anatomy. They were signed by Sony. Legit band. It's called The Donnies, The Amys. And they're releasing their new album today. The album is called High Fire. And here's a little 20-second taste. I was at the bar and falling over Then I saw he was standing with the combo cut out I'm going home now Tell me that you're anywhere So go check it out. You can listen for free at tdta.bandcamp.com. Stands for the Donnies, the Amys.bandcamp.com. Now let's get into the show. Welcome to smartpeoplepodcast.com, conversations that satisfy your curious mind. Chris Demp here. Hope you enjoyed that. Mixing it up while we're all losing our minds during a pandemic. Speaking of losing our minds got a great episode for you today. Let me just tell you, our guest this week wrote a best-selling book that was actually blacklisted from, I believe it was Amazon, like wouldn't be listed for a while. And it's because her stance on things like mental health, which we've covered before, are unique. And I'm a big fan. I'll tell you a couple of things. One, for the first 30 or 40 minutes of this interview, you'll notice my audio is a little off. Apologies. We actually recorded the first part of this last year. I was in the middle of a move. But the second thing I want to say is we actually had to bring her back on to finish this and have a longer conversation because after an hour of interview on the first time, I just said to her, I said, Kelly, I I can't end it like this. I can't leave it here. Some of the things she was saying resonated so deeply I needed more. For example, if you find yourself out there questioning societal norms, like for me, putting on a suit and a tie for 13 hours a day, like driving, commuting an hour each way to make barely a living wage type thing. I mean, it just doesn't make sense to me. Um, And it's not out of laziness. Hell, I I work harder than most people I know because I'm doing three different projects, three different companies, et cetera, et cetera. But What Kelly talks about is oftentimes the people that see what's broken, blame it on themselves. They say, it it must be me that's seeing it wrong. But she said, what if that's the reality? What if those people's antennas are tuned so properly and everyone else is kind of dead inside? Kelly's most known for her book, the one I was telling you about that got blacklisted, A Mind of Your Own. The Truth About Depression and How Women Can Heal Their Bodies to Reclaim Their Lives. And her newest book, which goes deeper in that subject, is Own Yourself, The Surprising Path Beyond Depression, Anxiety, and Fatigue to Reclaiming Your Authenticity, Vitality, and Freedom. Kelly is an MD. She's a holistic psychiatrist, author of a New York Times bestseller. She completed her psychiatric training at NYU Medical Center after graduating from Cornell And she has her bachelor's from MIT in systems neuroscience. So 
let me know what you think. We are at smartpeoplepodcast at gmail.com. I want to encourage you all two things. One, sign up for our newsletter. We've got a lot more things going out on that. So just go to smartpeoplepodcast.com. And our Patreon is growing slowly. We appreciate everyone who has signed up for that to support us at even a small amount as $2. I want to really say thank you to Darcy. Thank you to Artyom. I probably butchered that name. Uh, Lisa, Jenna, you all rock. We appreciate the support. Head on over to patreon.com slash smart people podcast. Support us, get cool stuff, access. I mean, for example, if you would have wanted to ask Kelly a question as a Patreon member, you are guaranteed for me to ask that question to our guests. I mean, how else are you going to get access to somebody like that for two bucks a month or five bucks a month? I mean, it's crazy. Plus you get ad free episodes. Let's tune in and listen to my conversation with Kelly Brogan as we talk about everything from anxiety, depression, SSRIs, medication, and more. Enjoy. You are divisive. You have diehard followers and people who just want to argue. And and I want to take both sides on this. And you also just mentioned that your first book, which was a bestseller, was blacklisted. And I I don't even know what that means. So start us off with this first book you wrote, what happened and why it was blacklisted, what that means. So I didn't know what that meant either because I was very, very new to speaking on a a public platform about my ideas. You know, I started off... Uh, first of all, a totally conventional psychiatrist, conventionally trained, believed so much in the medication-based model of mental illness that I specialized in prescribing to pregnant and breastfeeding women, prescribing psychotropic medication to that population. So I was a you know, a huge believer, and I did that in my private practice, and it really wasn't until I had this experience through my own health um, and my own first diagnosis of Hashimoto's thyroiditis, which is an autoimmune condition. Um, I was diagnosed with that on a routine physical about nine months postpartum, my first pregnancy. And that was the beginning of my learning about the severe limitations of the conventional medical model. And, you know, I was able to put my illness into remission. And I saw it in black and white on paper, and I did so through the help of a naturopath. And I, you know, you would have thought I would have been so relieved and excited and wow, this is so wonderful. But actually, I was consumed with rage. I mean, I I literally had this fire inside me light up that I thought might burn me alive. And I spent the following years, so this was back in, in 2009. I spent the following years just really obsessively researching um, everything that I might not have been told about in my conventional training, you know, because I was never told that, for example, nutrition has really any role outside of uh, type 1 diabetes, right, Um, or maybe a low-salt diet in in, uh, certain settings or a low-fat diet in the setting of cardiac disease. Outside of that, it was really not considered relevant. And I also was never told that you could put a chronic illness into remission. And I was, I was really angry because my training, you know, was blood, sweat, and tears, $200,000 of debt, you know, sleepless nights every fourth night of my life. And it was, um, it was a lot that I sacrificed and I felt betrayed, honestly, you know, the emotion it was betrayal. And so it was with this energy that I wrote my first book. <laughs> so, you know, there, it was a, a kind of sort of loft uh, treatise. And I, you know, I got an amazing, um, pretty unprecedented um, deal for somebody who didn't have any platform. You know, I, I was just a, just a girl, right, um, in the world. And I uh, got a deal with HarperCollins, uh, so top five publisher. And to my knowledge, they had never worked with an MD who had a perspective like mine. Uh, on the nature of uh, pharmaceuticals and and the prospects for healing without them or beyond them or after them. And so at that point, I had learned a bit about the role of pharmaceutical advertising. I learned that about 70% of mainstream media is subsidized, um, even you know outlets like NPR and PBS that you would think of as being fairly unbiased. Uh, and I also learned that we are one of three countries in the world that allows direct-to-consumer advertising 
you know, which means corporations are speaking to, you know, regular uh, individuals about their biology, you know, and uh, about the products that they, you know, produce to, to manipulate that biology. Uh, and so, I knew that this book was not going to find itself on, you know, the, the Today Show or even, you know, the Dr. Oz Show or, you know, 2020 and uh, certainly not a write up in, in any of the, you know, Wall Street Journal or whatever. And uh, I remember it was a month before my book launched that we hadn't secured a single, single um, piece of media. Not one. And they, this had never happened as far as I knew. And I remember you know, there were literally tears at the table. And I said, I told you, <laughs> I hate to be like that, but I, I, I told you so, and it's okay because I have, you know, I have a lot of activist colleagues and a lot of, um, you know, friends like yourself who have independent outlets. And it's maybe this is the beginning of a new era of, of journalism where it's taking it to the streets, right? Oh, I, I definitely think so. I mean, the gatekeepers are gone. Yeah, I think I thank goodness. You know, I'm not sure that's true for the vast majority of Americans, um, especially generationally. I think, you know, as you get into um, the older generations, I think there is still this this almost devotional relationship to, you know, uh, mainstream news outlets, et cetera, as as providing um, some version of the truth versus some, you know, largely curated uh, piece of propaganda I mean, to, to, to put it flatly. And so, you know, we were even told by one of the, um, you know, one of the main channels that if I was allowed on the morning show, that it would be bad press for me and for the publishing uh, company. So, you know, the galley had gone out all around. Um, and so we were ultimately told no by every single outlet. And, um, and that was, you know, it's actually quite a beautiful thing in the end. It's something like the, you know, I don't know if you've heard much about the censorship wave in the latest Google algorithm, um, but that's also affecting a lot of people in the natural health and other realms, um, you know, right, right wingers. And, you know, there's a lot of us who find ourselves in an interesting bucket mixed together. Uh, and it's, I, I have to believe it's what gives birth to creative uh, solutions to restriction of information. What is it about your book that was so divisive, that was so difficult. I mean, what it sounds like you're saying is things that are fairly common knowledge, like the pharmaceutical company pays for a lot of things. And, <laughs> uh, you know, we have this culture of take a pill for everything and media is skewed. I mean, all this seems like, yeah, I got it. So big deal. Mm -hmm. And I also can't, I can't imagine that you were the, the, the first person that kind of came out and said this. I mean, there no. was a book written, I don't know how long ago, about antidepressants and things like that. Really, the, um, I think all, a lot of pharmaceutical drugs that just says it's a it's a scam. So what was it that was that divisive? That's a great question. Um, I think something of it is the timing. You know, I, as you've importantly mentioned, I am, I think, an expert curator. You know, I have the the capacity to um, ingest massive amounts of information and, and synthesize it. And then I've been in practice for many years. So I had the lived experience of working with patients. I had my own um, healing experience. But there were many forerunners, you know, Peter Bregan and Joanna Moncrief and David Healy and uh, Irving Kirsch. And, you know, they've been talking about some of the tenets, which I'll describe you know, as, as being the pillars of this book for many decades. But I think my, my timing uh, has been important because I think there is a growing sense that we are working with a bankrupt system and that those who go to conventional doctors for help, they do so almost begrudgingly, you know, and there is a, a loud voice within that says, well, I'm going to do this because I have to, and it's my only real choice. Right. So, but what I, you know, presented um, was really what I learned after going back to the books. And I've always been very comfortable in the scientific arena, reading papers, you know, understanding how to glean whether it's a quality paper or not. It's just that I'd only ever been exposed to one side of the aisle's science. And the truth about science is it can tell any story. Um, right. So we're right. really at this moment where we are recognizing that we can actually choose 
uh, which story we want to pledge allegiance to. And one of the stories is, you know, that the body is essentially machinery, right? So we are flesh robots, as Alan Watts would say, on a dead rock floating around the middle of nowhere, subjected to the random forces of bad timing, bad luck, and, and bad genes. That is the model Um, that I trained in medically that's predicated on about 300 years since Descartes of an understanding of the body as being something to dominate through uh, intellectual and scientific mastery, right? And this, this psychology pervades our entire culture. It's the way we relate to the environment. It's the way we relate to education. Um, It's the way we relate to, you know, prisoners and transgressors. It's, it's, uh, it's a warfare mentality. And you can even see that in the names of our uh, medications, right? They're antibiotics, antihypertensive, antidepressants, anti-anxiety medications, right? We are at war and we are operating under the illusion that it's possible to win such a war when this involves your emotional terrain, your inner psychology, your spirituality, and of course your body, right? And and then there's this whole other burgeoning mindset, right? This 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 lifescape that you can choose to inhabit. And I think most of us are beginning to have some degree of awareness that we can make that choice. And this other, you know, this other option is radically different. They're really not compatible, actually. And and in this other option, there is an inherent sophistication to the body uh, that has only um, begun to be apprehended. And symptoms are fundamentally important messengers, right? They, They are describing and relating and even transducing that which we would not otherwise be able to generate awareness of. And it has to do with our lived experience, the environment, the context, our lifestyle choices. And through this experience of what we call illness, we have an opportunity to shed old versions of ourselves and step into up-leveled, expanded, and more powerful versions of ourselves. So everything is in service. Nothing is random. And the, the most I've noted, you know, the, the, the chief element of that perspective, that posture is the relinquishing of a certain kind of victim consciousness. Um, and that's what most of the folks that I have the privilege of working with either directly or indirectly are, you know, they've set out to do. And it's certainly my daily work um, in my own life is to examine where am I telling a story of, of poor me? this bad thing happening to me? And how can I reclaim my energy, reclaim my power and exercise the the, the choice um, that can be driven through my will to create a life experience that is a true reflection of who I am and and what I came here for? And in this way, symptoms are, are like the beginning of that incredible, you know, hero's journey, the heroine's journey. And, uh, and so we're in this, we're in this crossroads, but I think the reason that, you know, the book was so provocative and I think my latest book own yourself is even more so in ways, um, is because I have, um, I have proof (laughs) that this is real, you know, and, uh, that's what I've come to really focus on is I could, you know, I could tear down every single thing that I learned in medical school and find evidence to support its, you know, its being invalid from a scientific perspective, or at least incompletely valid. Um, but I'm less interested in that. We can certainly talk about those things. But I'm less interested in that than I am in everyone knowing what's possible. Right. So if you're about to have your thyroid removed because you were diagnosed with Graves' disease, if you know perhaps because you know we just published one of the first cases in medical literature history of reversal of Graves' disease through lifestyle medicine, if you know that it's possible to heal that naturally, would you still undergo that surgery? And that's where we come into the realm of informed consent. And I'm a big believer that we should be practicing ethical medicine, right? I think everyone agrees with that. That's one of the tenets. That's the Hippocratic Oath. So if we are to practice ethical medicine, then how are we going to resolve the fact that conventionally trained doctors are not in a position to properly inform their patients? I couldn't do that because I didn't know, right, about the untold adverse risks of 
psychiatric medications, including impulsive violence, such as homicide and suicide, including the habit forming nature of these medications that puts them at the top of the list of chemical dependency and protracted withdrawal associated with their discontinuation. I didn't know about that. So I couldn't possibly inform patients about that. I didn't know. Right? I, I want to pause you there. One of the yeah. things that, that strikes me is you know, I see both uh, conventional doctors as well as holistic doctors for various things of humanity, you know, ailments of humanity. But it, they always strike me as intelligent, even the, the westernized, you know, standard medical practitioners. How do they not know, for example, the things about SSRIs causing potentially compulsive behavior that leads to violence? I mean, it's mm -hmm. it's like I'm not a doctor, but I know that you know, a, a higher percentage of, let's call it uh, mass shooters, especially young adults, were on an SSRI. Mm -hmm. Like the, the thing that I struggle with, and maybe this is just because of the position I'm in on this podcast, talking to people, reading, et cetera, is it seems like this kind of similar story, right? It's like the microbiome and SSRIs, the dangers of antidepressants, et cetera. Is it just that these doctors don't want to believe it, or is that we are actively teaching misinformation in yeah. medical school? It's the latter. I had the same question because remember, I was like super enraged, right? And I was like, how did mm -hmm. I not learn any of this? You know, I read a book called Anatomy of Ad an Epidemic, which led me to that's the book. Yeah, it's yeah. an incredible yeah. book. He's a hero to me, you know, Robert Whitaker and has been. And, and his book inspired me to put down my prescription pad in 2010 for good. And I have never started a patient on medication since. And I, I think I'm one of the only, you know, psychiatrists with a public platform who can tell the tale of what happens, you know, when you practice that kind of medicine. And it was because of the scientific research that he presented in that book. And I was like, how is it that I've been paying attention in school and my, you know, many, many years of training, and I've never heard of a single one of these studies. I didn't, I couldn't understand the question you just asked. And I actually found this paper that said that on statistical average, it's a 17 year delay from what appears in the medical literature to trickling down to your doctor's office and becoming gold standard practice. And so instead, you know, what the Cochrane database, which is, well, I'll say formerly, was one of the only uh, seemingly third party objective ass assessment uh, tools for the literature itself, right? So they call it consensus medicine that's being practiced, meaning that doctors are simply practicing medicine because uh, their doctors are practicing medicine that way, right? Not because it's actually based in the literature. And if you think about, you know, a doctor's lifestyle, there's no spaciousness. There's no room for investigating right. anything beyond that consensus unless and until you yourself have a personal experience of health crisis. And you'll find, I think almost to a person, the MDs who've gone into the functional medicine realm, the holistic realm, the alternative medicine realm have done so because they themselves had a lived experience of the limitations of this model. And so, yes, I think doctors are incredibly well-meaning and also bear in mind what it must feel like to put what we put into our training and then have some patient be like, well, but I read on a blog, you know, that uh, what you're recommending is possibly dangerous. These are also human beings, right? So they're not just purveyors of data. And so that on an, on an ego level is very injurious. And that's why I sometimes joke, you know, you have to bear in mind that going to a doctor, a conventionally trained doctor to learn about your options um, and the benefits and potential risks of other options is like being, you know, going to a butcher to learn about veganism. You wouldn't do that. So we are in uh, this interesting place where the individual is being empowered, whether they like it or not, <laughs> to learn about options before and if they even decide to go to a doctor. Because, you know, you may call that, what did you call them, like maladies of the human experience or whatever, yeah. but 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 we have become so inured, uh, we've become so habituated to chronic illness being just kind of part of the deal of being human, but it actually doesn't have to be that way. And, you know, in, in this way, you know, like me and my friends, we don't go to doctors. That's not a thing we do. And, you know, if, if we, if we were to choose to, it would be like with great deliberation um, and an understanding of the psychological realms that are 
you know, that you inhabit when you enter into the, the, a doctor's office. And, and part of that I've come to understand has to do with kind of our tendency to parentify, right? So I think so many of us are stuck in the, the childhood programming and the patterns that we've been engaging as defensive structures since we were kids, right? Like, for example, like needing to be right about something or um, avoiding something that's challenging, or we all have our own ways of dealing with uh, fears, right? And we, I think as a collective, have come to long for that perfect parent that we didn't have, right? And we see it in government. We see it in the FDA. We see it in our doctor. We might see it in our kids' teachers, right? So they're infallible. Obviously, they've thought about everything and they're here for our well-being. We can trust them. But what happens when you look behind the curtain and you see that it's a little man pulling the strings is you either, you know, you double down and you continue to engage that model in this you know, somewhat childlike, disempowering way, or you recognize the reality, which is you're in control. This is your show, right? And you have as much power and capacity to understand your own body, trust me, as any doctor, if not vastly more so. It's just that you need guidance in operating, you know, that, that system and coming into a place of intuitive power. I don't think that's something you just snap your fingers. And obviously that's what I've, I've come to recognize, you know, I'm here to offer is like the doorway to that um, type of lived experience. And now a quick word for this week's sponsor. This week's episode is brought to you by Ritual. We all want to do the right thing to keep our bodies healthy in the long run. But even if we try really hard to eat kale salads and drink green smoothies, we're still most likely not getting all of the essential nutrients we need on a daily basis. Enter Ritual, the obsessively researched vitamin for women. Ritual's essentials have the nutrients most of us don't get enough of from food, all in their clean, absorbable forms. No shady additives or ingredients that can do more harm to your body than good. Luckily, it comes easy. Two easy-to-take capsules provide nine nutrients you need to support a strong foundation for your health. And I know what you're thinking. Wait a second, John. You're not a woman. What would you know? Well, don't listen to me. Listen to my wife, Amanda. She's been taking them for a couple weeks now. Go ahead. Take it away. Thanks, John. Now, I'm not one to normally take vitamins, but these make me feel like I'm doing something good for my body. They're super easy to take each day and taste like you're eating a mint leaf. No other weird vitamin taste. I also like that you can take them with or without food, which is great for me, especially during this pandemic, because my breakfast time has gotten all messed up. So I can just take them quick and easy in the morning and then worry about breakfast a little bit later. Amanda loves Ritual, and you will too. Ritual Essential for Women is the multivitamin reimagined. From D3 to Omega-3, Ritual's Essential for Women helps fill gaps in a woman's diet. Ritual is traceable and transparent. For all you obsessive label readers, all of Ritual's vegan-friendly, sugar-free, non-GMO, gluten-free, and allergen-free ingredients and their sources are out there for the whole world to see. So listen up. Better health doesn't happen overnight. And right now, Ritual is offering our listeners 10% off during your first three months. Fill in the gaps in your diet with Essential for Women, a small step that helps support a healthy foundation for your body. Just head over to ritual.com slash smart to start your ritual today. That's 10% off your first three months at ritual.com slash smart. And now back to the episode. Well, I think one of the problems is even when you come to this realization, you don't know who to trust. I mean, I have a platform mm -hmm. where I can talk to almost anyone. And I still cannot get a damn answer on like <laughs> gluten. Like <laughs> this is, this is impossible. How can the average person be expected to, especially the average person in an environment where we're making less money, our dollar doesn't go as far. Healthcare expenses are ridiculous. We live in the middle of nowhere. I mean, yeah. I don't know. Even for me, it's just getting frustrating. And so obviously for everyone, I think it gets frustrating. What is the, like, how do we solve this when there's so many varying mm. opinions, all of high intellect and caliber? Yeah, that's such a good question. And as a seeker, you know, because when I had this rupture with the medical system, I had to find 
my own way, right? And I had already been burned, so to speak. So I wasn't about to go like just latch on to some other system. Um, and I had like a brief dalliance with functional medicine. And honestly, I, I sort of backed my way out pretty quickly because I realized like I'm not I'm not going to place all my faith in one model that's going to tell me how things are. I'm going to I'm going to figure this out for myself. And yeah, you got to try on a lot of costumes until you find the one that fits. So obviously some of the reason that I'm even probably speaking to you relates to my credentials, right? So yes, yes. Which I for sure am like, not, I want people to know. I mean, of course I'll mention it in the intro, but it's, I mean, NYU, Cornell, MIT, it's like, okay, she's got the training, you know? And everything that I have to tell you, I didn't learn at any of those institutions, right? So that's an interesting fact. And I would like to um, contextualize everything that we'll say in, in this session with the fact that I am only to be trusted in so much as my mission on this planet is to help people learn how to trust themselves, is to help people reclaim their own power and to get in touch with their own intuitive compass so that they can retain bodily sovereignty. So that, you know, they have mastery over their body organism that is not outsourced anywhere, not to the FDA, not to, you know, any authorities, certainly not to doctors, but not even to natural healers, right? So I have a very radical perspective on that. And so maybe the people that it might be worth listening to are the ones that actually tell you you're, you already know, right? So how do we get to that? How do we get to the fact that you already know what the deal is with gluten and you, you already know that, but how do you figure out what it is that you already know? And I found, you know, that there's kind of an order of operations that tends to work for the folks that I've interacted with to get clear enough. It's about getting clear and really recollecting the energy that you've been like leaking all over the place so that when you're encountering something new, you, you can actually use your body. Like you get a feeling in your body that's like, Nah, not for me. Or that's like, wow, this is amazing. And it feels that this is amazing feels like a remembrance. That's what I'm always told. And that's what I've often encountered myself. In fact, there's this Greek word I recently learned called anamnesia. And I think it's loosely translated to mean um, the remembering of something once known, right? So there's this like, it's this sense of recovering a piece of wisdom that you always had. And that's what it feels like to learn from somebody about things that are actually going to empower you in your life. It feels like something that makes so much sense that you actually already knew it. And I've, you know, I've heard this from so many of the, the people that I've worked with that I think it's the, the signature for many of us to cut through the intellectualism, which is fundamentally the realm of scientific debate that, as I said, is endless. It's endless and it's such a distraction and it's such a waste of time. So if you can just get that hit inside yourself and know like, hmm, this makes a ton of sense to me. So much so that I, I bet I already knew this deep down. Then you can navigate all of this uh, inundation of information with great ease. Well, and I like that because I will say, I mentioned this to you. I want to tell the listeners, I mean, how I came across you was through previous guests. One that led me down this realm was a, a guest we had on named Chuck Ruby. I advise everyone to check that out as soon as they hear this. Um, but it, what he was talking about as it relates to mental illness, you know, coming from myself who has been diagnosed with panic attack disorder it instantly hit me. And I was like, he's right. Like, I mean, I've been put on the ground because of this, you know, diagnosed with it, given a pill. And as soon as he said, I was like, I, I kind of knew that. I mean, so that resonates mm -hmm. to some extent. What I want to do though, and I, I think this is my fault as an interviewer, I've, I've waited a little too long, but it's just to clarify your stance on the mental model or the, the mm -hmm. medical model, what you mean by all this. Because one thing that caught me was you talked about how functional medicine didn't really resonate mm -hmm. with you. So what's the difference between functional medicine, call it standard medicine, and then what you believe in and are writing about and are essentially teaching? Mm -hmm. Yes. So... I have become most interested in what I have found to be through my research into uh, the placebo effect uh, to be the most important ingredient in health outcomes, which is mindset. 
right? And I have come to, to believe that the best treatment, right, for you is the one that fosters and supports and creates the conditions for your native mindset to feel held, right? And, and to, to incubate. Um, and because of that, I have found that this isn't about convincing anyone, right? So, so I wrote that book, A Mind of Your Own in 2016. And I thought, well, now that I've revealed everything I've learned about psychiatric medications um, and their untold risks, um, their overpromised benefits, and the fact that you can achieve uh, remission through natural means that actually isn't even offered through the conventional model, well, now nobody's ever going to take a medication who reads this book, obviously, right? And what I found was that that's actually not how it works, Kelly, right? Like that's this isn't a matter of convincing people, persuading people, and throwing data darts at them, right? That in fact, it's the mindset choice I mentioned at the beginning of our discussion. It's what do you believe? Do you believe that you're sick? Do you believe that you're damaged and broken for good? Do you believe that you inherited this plight and the best you can do is manage it? And do you feel like relief is the only thing you're interested in? Because if so, there's an entire medical model that I trained in <laughs> called conventional medicine that is the dominant orthodoxy of this country that will welcome you, right? And, and care for you the rest of your life. But if there's some something rattling inside you that says, there's got to be more to me than this right? And there's got to be more to my life experience than this. And maybe I'm here actually to break cycles in my hereditary patterning, right? And there's that, that little flame. Then I find that I can be very effective <laughs> at, at putting a glass wall around that flame and protecting it and allowing it to burn um, because I have been on both sides and because I know what it takes to inhabit a mindset that that radically commits to self-discovery and that ultimately engages in the practice of taking personal responsibility. So this is where you, you've referred to me as being devices, divisive. This is one of the, those um, you know, kind of hot button areas, which is that I believe that anyone who, be who believes in this model can resolve literally anything. And part of that belief comes from having worked with my mentor, Dr. Nicholas Gonzalez, who, you know, for 27 years had a uh, practice based on uh, holistic medicine where he treated terminal uh, cancer patients, metastatic cancer, and not only brought these patients to remission, but actually had long-term outcomes, which have never been matched by uh, conventional medicine. He always used to say, match my cases. They never could match one. Okay. So this, this model has the capacity to make miracles happen according to conventional medicine, but they're really not miracles. It's about like, if you think about a seed, right? And you think, well, a, a plant grows from that little kernel. That's a miracle, right? How the hell does that happen? We can't make that happen. We can't design that. We've, we can't engineer it, right? But it's the potentiality that is embedded in that seed that can be accessed when you create the conditions for the seed to grow. And so I have made a study of creating those conditions. And a big, big part of it has to do with setting the mindset frame. So the first parts of my books are all about like, you know, the first part of my most recent book is called Get Real. Like it's about how do we take a fresh look at what we are calling mental illness. Um, and then we create the conditions to send the nervous system this comprehensive signal of safety and that's when the magic happens. And that's when, you know, we have cases, um, many of which we're in the process of publishing of, you know, 18 years of lupus remitting, of severe migraines, of asthma, of, you know, allergies and multiple chemical sensitivities of fibromyalgia and IBS. And then, you know, whether it's uh, suicidal major depress depression that was like headed for electroconvulsive therapy or whether it's bipolar disorder or schizophrenia, you know, we have outcomes, OCD in all of these um, arenas. And it's not because I have a specific protocol for each one, right? It's because the conditions are the human conditions of creating um, a safe space for the body, mind, and spirit. And a lot of that comes through meaning, it's the story you're telling yourself about what is happening that your nervous system responds to. 
and I, and I, I, that's really, you know, the, the offering that I provide is how do we create that story um, of meaning happening here, of this being something that's, that's purposeful for your experience with no carve outs, right? So in my universe, nothing is random, nothing, right? Not your broken toe and not your breast tumor. Nothing is random. It all has deep, deep meaning for you. And it's about unpacking that. But it's also about getting to your ba- your baseline neurologically, you know, um, through your autonomic system, coming to, you know, a place of balance. Then it's so much easier to engage that journey of, of self-discovery and learning how to really be in your body and work with it without fear. So I describe what I do as lifestyle medicine. Um, I, I definitely practiced what could be called functional medicine for a number of years and found that the focus, and this is not to disparage it. I mean, I refer to functional medicine doctors every day. Some of my best friends are <laughs> functional medicine doctors. I think it's an incredible and revolutionary um, you know, discipline. But I, for my patients, and maybe this is specific to, to psychiatric um, labels and those who've been told that something is not only wrong with like their pancreas or their liver, but like something's wrong with them. You know, because there's something in a psychiatric diagnosis that is deeply condemning, I think, you know, and, and what's confusing, and I'm sure you can relate to, is that it also is like validating, right? It's like the moment you get a diagnosis, you're like, God, I knew something was wrong with me. Now I see it has an ICD-10 code and a name. Great, right? And it's like this, it's this trap, right? Because then not only are you opening a pill bottle that has your name on it, that's reminding you that something's wrong with you every day something permanent is wrong with you. Um, but then you're dependent on a system that is reminding you all the time that you're broken and something's wrong with you. And, and so many of the, the folks who have emerged out the other side of long-term medication, you know, through, through this work have told me, you know, you were the first person who told me nothing's wrong with me. And, and I like to think that that's actually one of my gifts is that I have the capacity to see people <laughs> like to see their full self, to see their full potential beyond, um, you know, the way they're, they're presenting. And so I, I do believe that nothing is wrong. And in fact, even more extreme, I believe that the people who are labeled, probably yourself included, are exquisitely sensitive individuals. Like these are the canaries in the coal mine. So not only is nothing wrong with them, but something is like extremely right with them, you know, more wait, right wait, than wait, 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 I, th- okay. We, I'm like, I got the goosebump moment. My listeners know what that means. Okay, so I definitely, I know I am. Uh, there's something wrong with me where like it's an oversensitivity type mm-hmm. thing. It's like an over empathetic. But is it's it an over, over everything. Is it over or is it correct? Is it aligned? And then the rest of us who haven't been captured by the psychiatric system, are we actually kind of like numbed? Are we half asleep? Are we checked out in a way that serves the, you know, our, our dominant culture? Right. Because to be able to punch a clock nine to five, you know, and, and function in, the, in this world as it is today, you've got to have something really shut down going on. This episode is brought to you by BetterHelp. Listen, we're all sitting at home. We've had a lot of time to think. And as you're doing that thinking, are you thinking about that there's something that's preventing you from achieving your goals? Are there things that are interfering with your happiness? If so, you have to check out BetterHelp. BetterHelp will assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist. It's online, so it's super easy. You can connect in a safe and private online environment, and because of that, you can start communicating in under 24 hours. Listen, this isn't self-help. It is professional counseling, and you'll have the opportunity to send a message to your counselor anytime. You'll get timely and thoughtful responses, plus you can schedule weekly video or phone sessions. And the best part is, you don't have to sit in a waiting room. You can do this all online. If you want to reach out and talk to someone, BetterHelp has licensed professional counselors who specialize in depression, anxiety, relationships, self-esteem, and family conflicts. And you don't have to worry. Everything that you share is completely confidential. We want you to start living a happier life today. As a listener of Smart People Podcast, you'll get 10% off your first month by visiting betterhelp.com slash SPP. Again, that's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash SPP. So sign up and join over 800,000 people taking charge of their mental health. One last time, you'll get 10% off your first month 
by going to BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash S-P-P. And now back to the episode. It's like, yeah. Kelly, I got to tell you something. I can't, I can't only talk to you for 30, 40 minutes. I can't, I can't, <laughs> I haven't, no, I'm just like, I can't even air this. I haven't even scratched the surface. I, this is, well, and I, I mean that in all, in all seriousness, yeah. like no, it's a lot. way I know. too many yeah, levels because what you just said about, I am almost dumbfounded. I'm almost, and here's why I want to get into, I need the numbers. Okay. I need the logic. I need the data. You talked about uh, data darts. I okay. I'm happy to, I'm happy to whip them over. Like, <laughs> like, like I am woo woo, but you are woo woo. <laughs> like you are, you are gone. Right. And, and I'm not saying in a bad way. I actually say, I'm saying it in a very, this is empowering mm-hmm. way, but man, the leap people yeah. have to make just seems yeah, like you. you are standing on a soapbox, you know? Um, and so I'm, there's just too many things to go over. Here's, let's just go with this for a few minutes. I have long wondered, in fact, it's probably my greatest source of mm-hmm. stress. How do people go to work at, leave at yeah. six in the morning, you know, go sit in an office for 10 hours under fluorescent mm-hmm. lights, uh, leave at six, sp- sit in traffic for an hour and a half and do it essentially every right. day. And I'm not disparaging that. I actually go the other way and go, something's wrong with exactly. me because I can't exactly. do that. And when I say I can't do that, this is what caused my panic. Yeah, I, know. I literally <laughs> you know, fell you know, unconscious. Tell me. I know. I know how it goes because your story is the story of every single person I've ever interacted with. And okay, so there's a quote I often reference by Krishnamurti that says, it is no sign of health to be well adapted to a profoundly sick society. Our society is on its deathbed, as my friend Charles Eisenstein would say. We are misaligned in every single way that is possible to be misaligned. And we all feel it on a deep level that massive things are missing from our human experience. It cannot be this, waking up to this hamster wheel grind in a, in a frantic you know, race towards the finish line. It's like the point of, of as Alan Watts would say, again, I, I adore him, you know, the point- Well, Alan Watts is one of my favorites, yeah, so, so just for the, 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 the point <laughs> of a song is not to get to the end of it, right? The point of, of dancing is not to get from one side of the room to the other. It's like, we know that, right? Except we've, we've lost touch. And so the people who on a deep level, their body, minds, and spirits are saying, no, no. That no is called anxiety. That no is called depression. And in other complex ways, that no is called psychosis, right? So the, this is a, it's a reframe and it is, it's a, it's a 180 reframe because it is my belief. And there are a few things I am more passionate about that the individuals who have been labeled with mental illness and most of them have been medicated, right? that these are the sentinels of our time. These are the people, I get goosebumps even saying it because I I just feel so strongly about this. These are the people who have that sensitivity to say, this is not working guys, this is not working. And who happen to also be creative individuals. These are artists, these are visionaries, right? And to a person, when I help facilitate, you know, the discontinuation of these medications and the healing of the body, right. And the reclamation of power through this mindset shift, there is a creative like fountain that gets unleashed. And these people begin to come into contact with what it is that they're here to gift the world. Right. And so these visionaries are the one, ones who are going to walk us out of this mess, because trust me, it's not going to be the ones and zeros people like me <laughs> who, who really thrive in a, in a society like this, because we know how to dissociate. We know how to shut down our souls. We didn't even know we had souls, right? I went through an entire medical training. The word was not uttered one time. <laughs> okay. And believe it or not, psychiatry etymologically means doctor of the soul. So I I do believe that part of my destiny is to help liberate these individuals from a belief that something is wrong with them and to help them understand that walking this very simple path, you know, into this new chapter of their life experience, uh, potentially away from medication is something that we all need. Like as a planet, we need this. 
like, we need this of you, right? And if you're open to it, if you're ready for it, then I have the, the methodology. But trust me, I get it because I remember I was on the other side and it was a bridge of like little scientific pebbles <laughs> that brought me here. I didn't have some like epiphany one day. I followed the science and I went one study to another study to another study. And I'll tell you, I'm sitting in front of my computer right now. I have a tab open from this week, okay, a, a study published. I'm just going to read you one sentence from it. Should, here's the title. Should This is from the BMJ. If you don't know about science, this is one of the most esteemed journals on the planet. Should antidepressants be used for major depressive disorder? The conclusion, literally, okay, where was it? Is antidepressants should not be used for adults with major depressive disorder before valid evidence has shown that the potential beneficial effects outweigh the harmful effects. This is in the BMJ. You want to know how long it's going to take for that little nugget to sink into your doctor's practice? 17 A couple years. decades, okay? So <laughs> you heard it here first, right? And yeah. it's been said for many, many decades, again, by my predecessors like Peter Bregan. And so it's a matter of, does that validate something that you kind of already knew was true? Or does that feel like something important is being taken from you. Cause you can still today go and get your prescription. But if there was some little part of you that was like, I don't want to take this pill. And if I had another choice, I would, I would take it. Right. Especially if I knew it had an outcome that was even superlative relative to what I'm being offered through, through my conventional doctor. Well, now we're in that kind of time where you create your own adventure. So Kelly, one of the things I want to talk about is this, the science, because the science is still readily up for debate. And what's weird is uh, I can talk to two different people. I actually just heard recently a psychiatrist talking about the wonders of antidepressants, anti-anxieties, SSRIs, all that stuff. Um, but I've interviewed numerous people talking about how that has completely been debunked. So I just like to spend a few minutes from your end setting the record straight. What does the science actually show as best as we can know? So I love the word debunked. That, whenever you hear that word, you know that you're speaking to somebody who has an agenda. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and listen, we all have agendas, right? So that's part of understanding um, the nature of, of intentionality and our desire to surround ourselves with others who share our belief system. The, the thing is, as somebody who's been on both sides of the aisle, I know firsthand that science can tell any story that you'd like it to, right? And, you know, I have experience um, actually through my conventional training, analyzing whether a paper is valid, right? Are there conflicts of interest? Are there holes in the statistical analysis? You know, who wrote who wrote the paper and, and what is their, you know, clinical experience? And even with that kind of background, you still will be able to find science that supports really any perspective right? That integrative medicine is best, meaning, you know, a little fish oil with your Prozac or that, you know, um, lifestyle-based medicine is best, condemning the conventional interventions or that conventional medicine is best. You're going to find um, data to support any of these perspectives. So that's why it's really about what belief system feels better to you to live in. Choose right? We have to choose. And we, we are at this amazing moment in, in the history of medicine where the choices are plainly evident in a way that they were more obscured in the past, you know? Uh, and, and so now there is, you know, there, I'm not the only one who's presenting the science for the perspective that lifestyle change is not only uh, potentially more effective, meaning that outcomes through lifestyle change are available that are simply not on medical record. So, you know, I have a, a, a about 14 clinical volunteers um, who help me to publish case reports that come out of my online program and come out of my practice. The reason that I spend so much of my spare time doing this is because I know that these cases belong in medical history and they aren't there yet, right? So whether it's remission of 18 years of lupus or uh, Graves' disease that avoided a surgery that's in total remission or chronic recidivistic schizophrenia or 
you know, suicidality that was uh, post 40 rounds of electroconvulsive therapy. Now this, you know, woman is completely off five medications after 25 years. You know, these cases belong in the literature and they were never on offer when I was prescribing. That was never the clinical goal, right? So not only is it potentially more effective, not only are there clearly no side effects and there are side benefits, right? Um, but then there's also the issue of cost, right? So what are we paying? What are insurance companies paying? What are tax dollars paying? And, you know, that's not my favorite topic nor my expertise, but it's certainly a consideration, right? And so that's all, you could find the science to support that. But in the end, it feels to me better to live in a mindset that says, chronic illness doesn't need to be chronic, right? And that says that what you're experiencing actually can be resolved once you understand what it was about, right? And these questions, the why questions aren't relevant. So if you go, you know, I like to say, if you go to, to, to the butcher, don't ask about veganism. It's the wrong place, right? You're, you're going you're gonna to learn a, a highly skewed and, and distorted perspective on something that you may be interested in. So I, um, what I found, though, to more succinctly answer your question, when I began to look into the science after I read Anatomy of an Epidemic, which in a nutshell basically says we have ever escalating rates of prescribing psychiatric medications. So why is it that in lockstep, we also have ever escalating rates of mental health disability, such that major depression is the number one cause of disability worldwide, according to the WHO. What's going on here? Shouldn't we have more treatment, more access to treatment and less disability? Shouldn't those be inversely proportionate, right? And so Robert Whitaker, who was an investigative journalist who had no skin in the game either way, when he looked at 16 non-industry funded studies, he found that it is the iatrogenic effects of medication. That means doctor-induced harm of medication that are driving epidemics of quote-unquote mental illness that would simply not exist were we to cease prescribing today. Okay, that's my summary of his of his statement and it's very provocative. And if I had been given this book, you know, year two of medical school, I first of all never would have read it. And second of all, would have had the capacity, you know, to to argue against it. Right. So Robert is in debates all over the world about this. Frankly, I don't, you know, I was on the Joe Rogan show and he asked me back to do a debate. And I was like, honestly, it's not it's not enjoyable. And it's not meaningful to debate about this because it's like, you know, which is the better religion, Judaism or Islam? Right? Are we going to debate about that? It's that's not the nature of the question. This is an ontological matter. And so I became very interested, however, I was open in what he proposed. And when I went back um, into the literature, I looked at the, you know, collated and curated literature that people like Peter Bregan and Joanna Moncrief and David Healy and Irving Kirsch before me had collected. Um, that basically states a couple of important things around efficacy and safety of these medications. One is that the so-called chemical imbalance theory or monoamine theory of depression, let's say, but it's kind of extrapolated to other illnesses like bipolar disorder and you know OCD and generalized anxiety and schizophrenia even, that there actually isn't in 60 years of literature one valid human study that demonstrates a pathological mechanism, meaning that, that we can be sure what is actually biologically going on and that these entities have a biological signature. Not one, literally. Postmortem studies on suicide, um, you know, those who chose suicide, wh whether it was blood analysis of metabolites or EEG scans or, you know, whatever it was, however they looked. Um, they found, you know, highly inconsistent results. And there was never this, they never found the signature genetically, uh, biochemically or otherwise for what we are calling disease entities. So it's important that we not consider these to be disease entities. They're, they're simply not. They're descript descriptive terms, right? And so that's where this idea of reverse engineering, um, you know, this chemical imbalance theory from the effects of medication 
came to be. And the early days of antidepressants actually, you know, sort of emerged. Um, there are a number of different theories uh, about it historically, but the one that I'm most familiar with is from tuberculosis patients and the impact on their mood, albeit transient, right? So it was like for a couple of days um, that they had mood elevation seemingly through their tuberculosis medications, which happened to have an impact on these certain chemicals, including serotonin in the brain. And so that was one of the ways in which this theory was developed. Research has abandoned this theory long ago, like literally three decades ago, research on the serotonin theory of depression stopped. And now it's transitioned into the cytokine theory, which is the inflammatory model. That's why you're going to see pharmaceutical companies um, coming out with labeling for anti-inflammatory medications um, to treat depression, right? Wow. I didn't know that. I had actually not heard about the inflammatory argument now. Yeah. In the literature, it's called the cytokine theory and it's like old, <laughs> like it's been around for a while. It just takes so long for this to translate. Uh, you know, one of the stats I, I read was 17 years, you know, that it takes to translate from the literature to, uh, to, to clinical practice. And it's just, it's just a dinosaur of, um, a system. And, you know, so, so we have this kind of all these question marks about what is actually going on with this, this, you know, a uh, disease state of, of mental illness. Is it a disease state? You know, we have a lot of unanswered, is it genetic? A lot of unanswered questions and a lot of pretty indicting um, literature that suggests it's not. And then you have, you know, these medications and, and I found the most compelling research was done uh, by Irving Kirsch, who is arguably the world's placebo uh, expert. And what he basically found is that the impact of these medications, right? So they have an effect. No one's arguing that. They have an effect, right? But is that effect different than some other intoxicating substance that alters your state of consciousness like alcohol? And now a quick word from this week's sponsor. This week's episode is brought to you by The Great Courses Plus. With all that's going on right now, we at Smart People Podcast are so grateful for The Great Courses Plus. What an incredible resource this streaming service has been for us and our families. The Great Courses Plus provides the space to continue exploring the world while staying indoors, keeping our brains active and engaged. There's so much you can learn, a course for every curiosity. From hobbies like playing guitar, practicing yoga, or performing magic tricks, to classics like history, science, and literature. If you don't know where to start, we recommend checking out the course Brain Myths Exploded. Lessons from Neuroscience. Have you ever wondered how are smartphones affecting our intelligence or are other animals as conscious as humans? Well, if you have, check out Brain Myths Exploded. You can watch or listen anytime through the Great Courses Plus app. Even stream the videos to your TV to watch as a family. You can keep the kids learning while they're out of school. Whether they're high school or college students, it's a great supplement to education for any age. And now is the perfect time to start. Everybody's inside. Everybody could be learning. The Great Courses Plus is giving our listeners this fantastic offer. A free trial of unlimited access to the entire library. Sign up today using our special URL to get started. You can start your free trial at thegreatcoursesplus.com slash smart people. Again, that's the Great Courses Plus dot com slash smart people. And now back to the episode. Right. Well, and I want to, I want to pause you there because yeah. what's funny is I can go back to, uh, when I first started having panic attacks, I mean, 15 years ago or so. And, and I remember they prescribed an SSRI and I went on it and I remember pretty soon after having another panic attack coming on. And I remember very clearly telling myself, well, it might be coming on, but because I'm on this drug, I'm not going to that, yeah. have a full panic attack. Yeah. Now, this was literally, I had no idea. I had never done any research. I just, the doctor gives you something, you take it, nothing, right? And now looking back, I'm like that, look, it, it did have a physical effect. It did on and off for a while. I get that. But I, rem I mean, I can remember that is placebo in a nutshell. You're just telling your body, I'm going to be fine but you're telling it that because of a substance you just ingested. And in the same way, if I was drinking, you know, it, it would almost never 
um, escalate to anxiety because I was just chilling. I was just hanging out. You know what I mean? So I can see, and I've heard this idea before that just like any other substance, it will alter you. And it will also, if you're told, here's how it will help you, then there's a good chance it will that way. Exactly. And you're, you're referring to the psychological aspect of the placebo effect, which is the, you know, it's like Bruce Lipton's work, if you know that, like the, the power of belief to literally alter your cellular physiology. Right. There is also, so that's kind of like a mind to body, but there's also a body to mind where the, and this is what Irving Kirsch researched, which is, he calls it the active placebo effect, which is that when you have side effects early side effects from a medication, whether it's dry mouth or diarrhea or headache, your physiology then translates a belief into a physiologic effect. So you, mm -hmm. your body feels that, right? That dry mouth. And then because you've been conditioned through direct to consumer advertising, you have faith in your doctor, whatever it is, your body then unleashes a healing effect, right? Because mm -hmm. you're saying it's happening. I'm being treated. Right. So that's why if you study these medications and you put give some folks a, a sugar pill and some folks Effexor and Effexor has all these side effects up front and they, you've been warned about the side effects, but you don't know what you're getting. When you feel the side effects, you say to yourself, ah, I'm in the treatment group. I'm getting yeah. better. And then yeah. it's actually that belief that induces a shift. Now, it's not a huge shift. It's about, you know, 23 to 30 percent, um, you know, effect, but it's enough to separate from placebo if not controlled for. Now, if you study and you, you control for those side effects, like you give a medication, like a cardiac med, like atropine that has the same kind of side effect profile, there is no difference, right? right? So how can we say that these medications are specifically treating the brain? I mean, it's a really preposterous notion, um, and so the research itself, and, and he uncovered through the Freedom of Information Act, unpublished literature that basically suggests that 82% of what we are calling medication effect is fully attributable to placebo. So that means that basically, you know, the other 18 or, you know, let's say 15 to 18% have, you know, benefit and the rest have all risk and yeah. no benefit, right? Well, so his work is very important. It is. And I, it all makes sense, especially from somebody who's experienced it, the interviews I've I've had, the, the books I've read. Here's what I'd like to do. Let's say, you know, there's people who are going to have their qualms with this argument, and that's fine. We can't, like you said about the Joe Rogan show, you can't debate everyone. I, I agree. I'm becoming more of a proponent of the case studies um, because all science can be skewed for the most part. And here's what I want to do. I want to say, let's say we're bought in and we've gotten this far, I want to give you the 10 minutes or so to speak to the people who have struggled with some type of quote unquote mental illness. And the reason I put quotes around it is because whatever we call it isn't the point. The fact is it is a struggle. People, it, it hurts. It, it make it changes lives. It disrupts lives. It's difficult. But, but I know from somebody who has dealt with this, it, hearing this thing that maybe it's the canary in the coal mine, Mary, maybe it's just you are able to sense disruption and dis-ease more so. And I've always considered myself that. So for those people, what do you say to them? Where do they go from here with this information, with this understanding on utilizing it more as a superpower than a disease? Yeah. So what I, you know, consider to be my <laughs> service um, to humanity, perhaps, is that simply to give permission uh, to those who are ready to begin to heal. And what I mean by that is that I, I, I'm obviously, you know, whether it's by virtue of my credentials or, or whatever else, uh, my passion, you know, for this subject, I'm in a position um, to articulate a perspective on what we are calling mental illness. And I'm not here to convince anybody. It's not interesting to me and it's, it's not effective. So what I am potentially here to do is exactly what you're asking, which is to point those who are ready to fully heal and step into their own power and understand who they are and what they're here to do, to point them in a direction 
And what I found is that, you know, I think a lot about this because the protocol that I'm about to mention is really pretty basic and it doesn't, it can't fully explain the outcomes that I've referenced, right? So, so I've tried to understand, well, what makes someone ready? How do you know you're ready? Because it's like, I always reference this Maya Angelou quote, when you know better, you do better. But it's kind of like when you know better and you're ready, then you do better. So what about that elusive piece, right? Because on, on a Tuesday, you may not be ready, but on a Wednesday morning, you might be. And when you're ready and you encounter this information that basically says there might be another perspective and there might actually be nothing wrong with you. And quite to the contrary, you may be the square peg trying to fit into the round hole of society. And you may be here to help us figure out where to go and how to get out of this mess, right? That's how important your particular sensitivities may be once you learn how to work with them. And once you learn how to you know, engage self-mastery. That's what this really is about. But unfortunately, there aren't many people um, discussing this concept because it is fundamentally threatening to the, you know, capitalistic infrastructure that we have set up, particularly in America, but of course that pollutes the entire world. And so if you're ready to engage that, all you need is some information, right, that's validating something deep inside that you've always known, and that there's something, some better life for you available. And then you need the portal, right? So this, this portal is, um, you know, what I've discovered, this is all, this is all I have to offer, right? Is that doorway. I can't lay out your journey for you. I don't know what kind of healers you need. You know, I don't know what kind of support you need, but what I do know is that there is a 30 day, you know, uh, process that can, engage your inbuilt readiness and operationalize it towards meaningful, lasting change. And so when that readiness is ripened, it's going to feel like a relief to move in the direction of change. And it's going to hurt intolerably to keep doing what you've been doing, right? So when that fulcrum, uh, you know, is reached, then you're going to need to move in the direction of a commitment to change, a choice to engage a new way of relating to yourself. And so, you know, this protocol that I've refined over a decade based on, you know, my own healing experience from Hashimoto's thyroiditis and my work with Dr. Nicholas Gonzalez, um, is essentially a means of orienting your energy towards yourself in, in an extreme way, right? So your nervous system is going to get the message like, oh, something new is going on. It's not something you can fit conveniently into your life because it's like about two and a half hours of like self-care ranging from, you know, dietary overhaul, um, overhaul of your uh, products and exposure, environmental exposures, um, detox and a contemplative practice or meditation, right? So this is a new way of being, it requires a lot of time and attention, and it's going to vectorize your energy towards this change, right? So where we put our attention, incredible things happen, right? Uh, mm. It's like creating the conditions for a seed to sprout. That's what's going on. You can't make the seed sprout. You can't yell at it to sprout. You have to create the conditions, and then it's going to happen irrepressibly, right? So so you you commit to that. And then your nervous system through these different behavioral changes gets what I call a signal of safety sent, right? From like 360 degrees, you're sending the message to yourself that everything is okay. It's like you did with, with that uh, near panic attack, right? That uh -huh. is so powerful, but we have to do it psychologically, biologically, you know, and, and spiritually. We have to begin to self-soothe in this deep, deep, comprehensive way, because then you liberate all of this energy that was otherwise going towards your brain fog and your, you know, malabsorptive digestion and your joint pain and your insomnia. And that can shift literally in a month. And then you have all this energy, right? And you can do with that energy, whatever it is that you've been needing to do, but just have been in such a state of overwhelm, whether that's re-examine relationships and your job, you know, move somewhere, whatever it is that is going to uh, optimize your experience of your own power to create your reality, that becomes 
available to you. You almost don't have to make any decisions after this point. And I've had literally hundreds of people confirm this for me, that it's that commitment, that choice to basically walk the walk of caring about yourself, even if you don't actually care about yourself yet, because most of us have to learn how to care about ourselves. Mm -hmm. We haven't been modeled that. Um, You walk the walk of it, and then it takes on a life of its own that leads you And that's why it leads you home to yourself, which is this phrase that I took from, I don't know, the first 15 people I heard it from in my practice. I said, seriously, every single one of you is saying the same thing. Like, I finally feel like myself. And I would say to myself, like, I didn't even think you wanted to feel like yourself. I thought that that was the problem. And instead, that's actually what we're longing for. We're longing to feel authentically ourselves so that we can finally step into this experience of trust and faith and and safety in the world and learn how to interact with other people from that, you know, solid foundation. And and that's where, you know, love and joy and bliss and ecstasy, they they emerge from there. So it's really like, um, you know, the dark night of the soul that so many of these folks go through in this healing process. It's like, you know, going into the cave of you and there's like this huge dragon, you know, it's scary as hell. And then on the other side is this gem and you know when you've got it, right? Like, mm-hmm. you know, that moment where you're like, oh, yes, it was all worth it. And and that you, you'll never lose that gem. It can never be taken from you. So it's, it's exquisite. I love that because it does, it resonates in just the sense of, I think a lot of people, and I've talked to a lot who've experienced this, you hit this wall of there's a moment where things just break and it's downhill from there and you go looking for answers outside of yourself. It's the first place we go. And I think the more answers you seek, the more outside of yourself you get. And I'm just speaking, I guess, from my own experiences, but even this podcast was from that. It was how can I ask other people questions that I need to know, as opposed to how can I just spend time internally to ask myself questions that I need to know? And What you're saying, I think, is that 30-day kickstart is basically saying, let's start to learn how to listen and put our intention inward. And of course, there are things that you have to do, whether it be food or rest or meditation, the things that no one really debates if they're good for you or not. It's just uh, much more than that to heal this deeper wound and these deeper issues. Yeah. And to shift mindset from a, you know, a materialist worldview that says, you know, I apply more force and through more force, things change, right? To what some call a quantum worldview, which is that actually when I embrace complexity and surrender into a larger design, I emerge, you know, it's it's a Mm. totally different um, conceptualization and and frankly, one that's far less scary uh, and far more fulfilling. And that's why I prefer it as a, as a worldview. Well, Kelly, I love it. And I'm sure we're going to stir up a lot. I actually want to encourage listeners to email me at chris at smartpeoplepodcast.com or reach out to Kelly. And Kelly, I'm going to ask you where the best way to get in touch and work with you is. But I'd love to hear from everyone. What do you think? And how do you feel about all this? How does it resonate for you? So Kelly, I just want to turn it over to you first, say thank you. Second, uh, say, you know, your newest book, Own Yourself, The Surprising Path Beyond Depression, Anxiety, and Fatigue to reclaiming your authenticity, vitality, and freedom is out there. It goes into detail on everything we talked about. Where else can we direct our listeners and those looking to take it to the next level? Yeah. So we're just over at kellybroganmd.com. And um, if you'd prefer to see videos of me dancing, (laughs) then you can go to Instagram, um, (laughs) kellybroganmd.com. No, but it's, uh, yeah, we have tons of free resources and uh, places to kind of start this process over there. You do. I saw the free resources there. They're fantastic. We will link to that. And again, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for coming back on. I really think it wrapped this loop up and gave people some direction. So I'm very appreciative. My pleasure. Thank you. Hey, how y'all doing? No, really, how are you doing? How's it going through this just crazy, crazy time that we're going through right now? I mean, I know for myself, I go on a lot of walks with my dog and my wife been watching a lot of netflix trying to play the guitar again but man i just i miss seeing and talking to people so i hope you're doing well 
Hope you and your family are staying safe, staying healthy. Thank you so much for listening to the show, for downloading the podcast. And if you're new to the podcast, I just ask that you subscribe and maybe leave us a rating and review on iTunes or wherever you download your podcasts. And I hope you enjoyed that interview with Kelly Brogan. Kelly's book, Own Yourself, The Surprising Path Beyond Depression, Anxiety, and Fatigue to Reclaiming Your Authenticity, Vitality, and Freedom can be found wherever books are sold. And now the quick housekeeping. You pretty much know the drill by now. If you'd ever like to reach out to the show, you can email us at smartpeoplepodcast at gmail.com, message us on Twitter at smartpeoplepod, or follow us really on any social platform that exists. I think we're on all of them now. And of course, if you're trying to stay up to date with all things Smart People Podcast, head over to the website, smartpeoplepodcast.com and sign up for the newsletter. All right, that's it for us this week. We've got a lot of great stuff coming out, so make sure you stay tuned and we'll see you all next episode. Bye.